Good morning, good morning. So, you guys got a uh, QAP yesterday. Whoa, not that. Yeah, so you guys got a QAP yesterday. So, here, why don't I um, give a walkthrough of how I think you go about solving it? Just to let you know, where are we here? Okay. So, themes. Oh, there we go. Assignments. Woohoo. Party on dudes. We're over here. Okay. Like somebody's mouse. Somebody's sharing the screen, man. Good thing you got a shirt on. Um, so, yeah, let's take a look here. So I created, I created this part of the QAP. This is the one that just went out July 16 to 26, that's about right. And so this last section, project four JavaScript. So I put it into this JavaScript. Project for JavaScript. So this is really kind of what we did Thursday afternoon. So when you when you read stuff over, um, yeah, if you look at uh, if you look at the this is just the same text. I just cut and paste it out of the uh, just to let you know, cut and paste it out of the QAP that was there just to discuss it, right? So. Create a reasonably complicated object in JavaScript. Contains attributes for the motel, motel customer. Maybe the line feed. Sorry, quite the best because I cut and pasted and put it in a notepad. But and I think the motel customer is something that um, that that occurs earlier in this QAP. But then it's it's got a bunch of stuff here. Customer attributes, you can lit, but not limited to customer's name, birthday, gender, blah blah blah, payment method, mailing address, like all this sort of stuff, right? So um in other words right and then what do you say here the javascript code should create a template literal string or properly formatted html that describes the customer right so that really is what we kind of covered last the end of last week right and so when i turn around and i actually go and look at the exercise for last week um here you go look at the exercise I'll zoom in here a little bit. Let's go to 150%. Okay, so um, the second page of your exercise was creating your own object, right? Design your own object. So here's the here's the basic object, and then start adding attributes to it, right? This is exactly what I'm asking for in in this create a reasonably complicated object in JavaScript, right? So it's uh, you know make it fairly complicated and even to the point where you could actually have a function embedded inside this object right and here's the syntax for it so that's pretty that's pretty straightforward and then we also um started talking about template literals and i'll look at template literals again today so that's this idea of building a string and just emitting it out to admitting it out to an HTML page or just go console log with the string you generate. We'll look at that today again, but I've already looked at the concept of template literals, but as a reminder. So this is that's really it for, from the for the QAP from the JavaScript perspective. Is that really the the hint to this whole thing that you have to do for the QAP is right here as the object literal in the second page of the of the exercises from Thursday. Anyways, I will pause there and see if there's any questions. Either type them in or speak up or, or whatever you want to do. Expectations. Oh, what are my expectations? Yeah. That's good. Really, it it really is. If you're referring specifically to the QAP, oh, we got a hand up. Hang on, who is that? Where is that? Uh, Ethan, 
Go for it, man. Peter? Answer your question. Um, I was just wondering, uh, could you go back to the QAP uh, paper? Sure. Okay. And if you just go down to the JavaScript part, I was just going to ask about well, one little thing about that. Sure. Go ahead. I was just wondering in regards to the template uh, strings and the HTML. Is it just like you only want one or the other? Like you don't uh, have. You can, you like can you do both have, if you want. One or the other or both makes no difference to me, actually. Oh, okay. So we could just do template uh, literal strings or HTML, or we could do both. Any way yeah. of those is fine. Yeah, yeah. Mostly what I'm looking for is that you, you, you understand the template literals. That's a super important concept is just how to use template literals. All right, yeah. So we could just do like, we could just do template literal strings or we could just do HTML or we can do both. Any way of those is all right. Well, the assumption would be if you're using HTML, you're using a template literal within for the HTML, right? Like in some way, like what I'm really looking for is the use of the template literal. OK, so you would like recommend we do like both of them. Um, yeah, OK. <laughs> no, I'm not I'm not recommending you do both of them. You do what you'd like, to be honest with you. But the main part is, is to create a template literal. Absolutely. Like th it's this, right? It's this idea of of um, you know, here, here I'll go this way. Let's uncomment this. It's this, right? It's that back tick and the ability to embed embed the name there, right? So if this was, if I was to turn around and take here, I'll just really give a good example so that we reduce the confusion. Um, where was I? That was yesterday. Hang on. OK, so I guess really the template literal here would be, let's say, let's go, I don't need peep. Screw that. Let's go. Equals back tick. Uh, the person's full. Name is, whoa, look at that. Name is, don't really need that square bracket there. Space, dollar sign, squiggly bracket, and then it would be person dot, and then first, is that their first name? Yes. And then, and then dollar, squiggly bracket, person. Uh, the last tab, right? So that's really what we have there now is that that's that's the whoops. Here we go. It's got the last tick back tick there. OK. So that's a template literal, right? Like it's got the main thing that kind of makes it is, is I'm using this and I'm grabbing data um, from from the, this object that I've defined. So, so then if you turn around and and um, put that out into what would it be like uh, document uh, dot oh, I can't remember off the top of my head what that code is. Is it so log oh do the display HTML so I could write this template literal to console log right like I could do it this way I could do where is it
right? So that would work. But also from the document perspective, I can't, uh, this is my bad, I'm so bad at memory, uh, document body here, or that would admit it out to, that would admit it out to the HTML page. All right. Right. So that's really, I mean, that, you know, from my perspective, you know, that is, I mean, get a little bit more complicated, like, because you've got a more complicated object where you might be having this, uh, you know, a hobby in here or whatever. But you get the, that's the template literal with those back ticks and having the squirrely brackets and the dollar signs referencing the object and the attribute. Right. That's really that's really what I'm after is to to understand, to just confirm in my mind that you're really understanding this concept of object literals and how you access them and how you display them, either putting it out to a, the console or putting it out to the HTML. Do both do either. This is the bigger this is the more important part that I'm really looking for is that, yeah, by doing this, this template literal, you know, obviously a little bit more complicated than this shows me that you understand that there's this person object and they've got an attribute. It shows me that you're, you know, you're starting to use template literals and using this sort of dollar sign squiggly bracket to really get at the data elements uh, attributes of this, right? Like that's as a concept from a JavaScript concept and just a programming concept in general, super important. Um, and that's what I'm really just trying to give. Yeah, that's the QAP is to assess whether you're getting it. And if you can develop an object like this on your own and display it out to the console or an HTML page or both, that shows me that, yeah, you get it. And that's what I'm after as, as the faculty member that's teaching this part of the course is that you're kind of paying attention and that you've started to wrap your head around this concept of objects and 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 you know have you how you put data into them and how you reference that data all right yeah so we can just do both and as long as we show you that we understand the material and all that and as long as it looks good then we're fine absolutely man i'll probably give you a pass outstanding <laughs> <laughs> that sounds awesome okay <laughs> all right thanks so much peter i appreciate all the help Oh, no worries, man. No worries. Just I'm glad you're asking questions. <laughs> Believe me, it's the harder part. OK. So yeah, feel free to reach out to me and ask questions anytime too. Like again, I'll just confirm this. Like if you see me and I've got my little green check mark up on my ID, I'm I'm usually available. And I'm, you know, I haven't you guys haven't been that vocal, but you've got Dave Turner's helping you out. And I know that you guys are massively big brained group, right? No pressure, no pressure. But, um, you know, just that's just ask, man. Like it's this computer science is is sometimes super simple and sometimes not. So I'm here to help. 35 years of experience. I think I've learned a couple of things along the way and I hope I'm not, you know, I'm approachable. I try to be, try to be approachable. Anyways, so let's get on with getting on. So today is, I want to do the demo. See, let's save that. Sure, let's save it. Okay. So let's look. Really, today is the if statement and the switch statement. So, so really, you know, from a JavaScript perspective, you're going to be spending a lot of time working with if statements and switch statements, particularly if you're working with data and and you're getting data from a database and making decisions based on that data because that's really the journey we're on with the whole javascript interesting i had an interesting conversation with somebody uh, a third semester student about javascript the other day and and you know it was a good conversation because it really had me reflecting upon javascript and and you know if you go and search the web for lang programming language usage you know, JavaScript has consistently been in the top three programming languages in its different incarnations, meaning that Node, which you get into for the full stack, you start really pushing into Node at the end, starting to conceptualize Node, which is right now the JavaScript you're working on is mostly just working in the browser, right? The JavaScript that we're using, we're using it in, a, in an internet browser, right? So you're running your inner, you know, like when I look at this index.html page, I'm running this script on a web page, right? And that web page gets rendered in my browser. But what happens with JavaScript is we start using it on the server too, 
So it doesn't only, JavaScript doesn't only provide you a programming language that you could use from the client perspective or what's being rendered on their web page and what they're seeing with their eyeballs on the screen. You could also use JavaScript on the server to do a whole bunch of heavy lifting from the business rule perspective, because often the business, there's a whole bunch of business rules when people click on stuff and move around a website. There's a whole bunch of business rules that need to be, you know, complied with or executed upon and all those business rules you write in code and you can write that in JavaScript too, which is kind of the big innovation for JavaScript. The fact that you can have one programming language that you use both in your web browser and you use it on the server, right? Because really the whole client server or the internet is this paradigm where you've got your web browser that's sitting there and that's considered the client. The client's looking at data and usually it's their own personal data in their own browser, but that's reaching out over the internet and hitting some server that's hosted probably in some big city in North America or Europe or wherever. There's a whole bunch of big honking servers that are running in a server farm somewhere that's sort of answering all the requests that are coming from the browser. You can write JavaScript that runs on that end, and that's what's in, happening in semester two, semester three, which is known as Node. JS, which is it's just a server side JavaScript. The syntax is exactly the same. So what you're losing using and learning here from a if else statement or a switch statement or these variables or these arrays or everything runs both on the client side and on the server side, which isn't always the case, right? It, that is not always the case. And in fact, it's kind of the exception. Often all the software that's built on the server side is built in Java, which is not JavaScript. It's it's Java or C sharp or some other programming language, Python. And then the user interface is usually rendered with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So really, you know, the, the idea of HTML and, and cascading style sheets for you know rendering the web page, making it look good and responding in a in a in a in a good way and then resize based on whether it's a handheld device or a, bra a desktop machine. All that stuff in general is all sort of HTML CSS. And then on the server side, it's 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 JavaScript. Now, JavaScript is is a very framework-based language. And uh, the reason I'm sort of just want to touch upon this is because it, what we're learning is just the syntax. And what I mean by the syntax is it's like, this is the syntax of how you do an if else statement, right? That's the weird characters and, and squiggly lines and brackets and equal signs and numbers or whatever, the syntax that you use for the JavaScript language. But at, what you'll find when you get further and further into using JavaScript is it's very what framework based, meaning that you will often use like you'll include and you'll use libraries from different places. And I just wanted to sort of be, you know, I just wanted to mention that because it was really, it was really interesting to me having this conversation of a third year student who obviously has been through the first and second semesters or a third semester student who's been through the first and, and was really kind of going, I'm having a hard time learning JavaScript. And, and so if you're having a hard time with JavaScript, you know, that's fine. It's going to take time. Right now, we're just learning the syntax of the JavaScript programming language. Um, but what's going to happen is it's going to become uh, much broader, and you have to become more trusting of the frameworks that you include. And, and you'll know what I mean by frameworks when you start to use them. Um, but I just want to just sort of point that out to you, is that JavaScript is different than Python, where Python is, seems much more contained and it's a, as a programming language, where JavaScript, and particularly server-side JavaScript, by design is, is sort of framework-based, meaning that there's all these other libraries that you include and you use, and it sort of alters the way the programming language works. Anyways, I just wanted to say that because I think it's, it's an important thing to put in your head a little bit, is that what happens with JavaScript is it becomes much broader than just the syntax that we're learning. And you'll see that next semester in particular. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm not really going to teach you any of how it becomes more framework based. But just sort of be mindful that a lot of the stuff that we're learning here is really just this is how to use a hammer, how to use a, a screwdriver, how to use a, a spatula, you know, how to use a razor. 
I think that it we're really the beginnings of, of the tool, right? So I'm teaching you how to use the razor, but I've never shown you the bathroom, right? And so to just be mindful of that a little bit with the JavaScript language is that it, it, it's it's so much more than that. So anyways, I'm kind of a little bit off on a tangent, but it was, was an interesting conversation I had with a third semester student that sort of triggered me to want to have that five minute conversation about realizing that JavaScript is becomes so much more and if we were to do a search on JavaScript as a programming language, you'd see it's in the top three on the planet Earth as popular languages in use today. So there's value in using it. It doesn't go away if you're doing internet based development, that's for sure. OK. Um, let me just check if there's any questions. Woohoo. Right on. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Um, no, thank you about the O'Reilly stuff. Yeah, I did try to get it. You know, I, I have to be honest with you. I've been doing this for so long, I forgot what it's like to be a beginner. <laughs> um, and I, I'm not trying to say that to be, you know, unkind or anything. It, it was a challenge for me a little while ago to really try and bring it back to keeping things simple, right? Like, I think it's important, right? Um, do you want us to design a page? You know, honestly, design a page, you know, if you want to design, I would actually put that in your, Patrick, I would put that in your, you know, put that in you, how you want to approach it. I love it when people put in extra effort. Honestly, I do. And I recognize the extra effort um, and, and, and usually in the grading. But you don't have to. Like, I do think the one thing about the key in grading approach is whether something's complete or complete with distinction. It's like, uh, you know, I I try and create the have the bar fairly low, and you'll get to know this. I mean, because you're going to see me again in semester three, right? Um, I I in general, what I really aspire to is, and that and that's why I have rubrics. You'll find that I start using rubrics a lot in semester three, where I really define what success looks like. Right, so that you can actually follow the rubric along and and go. Oh, I want to get a pass with distinction, or no, I got way too much going on in my life. I want to just get mostly complete on this QAP. Like you can actually decide which mark you want, and then just just do the work based on what you aspire to do. So if you want to go and design a page and and it emits that object into nicely formatted HTML with CSS, I'm gonna go fuck yeah. Sorry, excuse my language. And and but you know I'm gonna go. This is awesome. Like th that's the creative side of this. Like it, I I almost would uh, encourage you to do that to start making programming fun, right? Like 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 it's programming is as much a science as it is an art. Like that's the thing that I find so beautiful and why I'm so passionate about it and why I've been doing it for a living for 35 years. It's because because I don't know anywhere where you can take ideas out of your head and actually create something that runs that idea for you, right? Like that's what software is. It blows me away. Like I don't really know of any other industry where sure engineering does, accounting, sure there's a bunch of stuff, mathematics takes ideas, but there's no way to take ideas out of your head and then start it executing seven days a week, 24 hours a day. That is cool in my mind, right? And then you turn around and look at the creative side of the data and the analytics of it and, and just the even the graphical user interface. like. I get blown away when I go and look at websites that are just so intuitive and easy to use and, and a visually appealing. Like, so all that sort of stuff. If you want to start playing with that stuff and start exercising on that, I will recognize the extra work. And that's what, in my mind, the whole pass with distinction is about or the complete with distinction is all about. Like, if you want to put in the extra effort, I'm going to recognize it, right? But don't put in the effort if you don't feel as though you have the time. I know that people have lives, right? They got some of you got kids, some of you like so just do do like completing stuff and understanding the concept is really good enough for me. But if you want to put in the extra effort, I go good for you, man. If you have the time and you want to do the creative side. Sorry, that was a long explanation for that. But thanks for asking, Patrick. I really do appreciate that. You know, I try my best to keep things as tight as I can as you're learning concepts. But if you want to put in the extra effort on stuff, you're going to learn more along the way. But sometimes you don't need to learn more. <laughs> Anyways, OK, 
So let's um, let's continue. Where are we here? OK, so the if statement. So this uh, is really I, kind of, oh, Peter, sorry. I'm sorry. I also had just one more question, right? Sure. Um, so yeah, in the end, it's like it's up to us whether or not we want to make a full on page or not, right? Or we could just yeah. do what you want, like the job, or right? Just put it in the console or whatever. Yeah. Okay, yeah. either way is fine. Either way is fine. And, and honestly, it's a great question for me because I do know that there's a different cohort of people in this class with the fact that there's almost what 50 or something of you. You know, some of you are gonna have, you know, the same puts the pressure on if you want to take it as pressure. But I mean, and do it for the enjoyment, right? Because in the end, you know, this program is about passing and learning skills, right? Um, but it, the extra effort, yeah, absolutely. Enjoy yourself. Really do it for a personal enjoyment perspective, honestly. Because <laughs> if you're doing it and disliking doing it, you're not going to want to have fun with this as an industry or as a career. Anyways. OK. OK, Peter, thanks. No worries. No worries. OK. So the if statement, right? This is really making a decision, right? So so what I'm trying to do here with this if statement is if something is equal to something, then you know just tell me, right? So here I can turn around and do that if statement. So I'll go out index page, do a open with live server. Come on, if else, open up the console. Okay. Hmm. No, I don't want to reload, but I do want to reload that. Okay, so so if is correct. I don't know why it says the first name is unknown. I must have said I didn't comment out all the code, but here's the if else. Oh, no, yeah, I got first name. Okay. Ah. What happened there? Oh no, it's because. Okay, so here we got this if statement. ID is 100 and the first name's Matt. Right, so if the ID is 100, that's correct, right? And that's a double equal sign, right? So double equal sign is like a comparison, right? It's not making something equal to something. It's doing a comparison. And this is where, you know, you have to start sort of putting your head into it out a little bit about comparison operators, um, you know, and there, there's a few of them and we'll, we'll, look, at, we'll look at them in a, in a moment. So you've got this comparison, you know, if something is equal to that, which is different than, um that right if id so all of a sudden now you've set id is equal to that right and i can turn around and go 99 this is probably going to confuse things a little bit right uncaught oh else if assignment of constant variable obviously so there's something just weird going on in general right assignment to a constant variable like what it's doing is is that how am i assigning 99 to id which is a constant id 100 like i can't do that but if i just go equal equal then that's a comparison it's just doing is this equal to right and that sort of idea so that so when i save that and i take a look at that it's fine it goes it's incorrect right because it that's true because it's comparing it to 99 so 100 does not equal 99 right so that's that sort of idea right same thing with strings you know, I've got this thing, Matthew, right? Matthew is not Matt, right? So the first name is going to say no. The first na first person's name is unknown, and that's exactly what's saying here, right? But if I was to turn around and and say if first name is Matt, doing the same comparison, right? And then here's the template literal, right, with the back ticks. That's this little back tick, right? So we've got double quotation marks, we've got single quotation marks, and we've got this back tick. That back tick is what allows you to have these template literals where you can have these dollar signs and the squiggly line and embed the variable in the string, which, you know, as you get through programming and you start playing around with the different quotation marks, which inevitably you're going to do through time just from reviewing other people's code or writing your own code, you will start to realize that there's a difference between a double quote, a single quote and a back tick. Anyway, so if I if I save this and I run it, you'll see here that it now says, yes, the person is Matt, right? So it was able to do a comparison on either the equal sign um, on numeric values, but also string values, right? So that's what the if statement is. If, it, if it's true, do this, otherwise do this. That's kind of what the if else statement is, right? Do something, otherwise do something else. And in theory, just to really get into the syntax of this stuff, 
Um, if you if you uh, only have one line of code, you don't need to put the squiggly lines in there. I know it kind of looks kind of weird. Don't do this as a practice, to be honest with you. <laughs> right? But you don't have to have, if it's only a single line of code, you don't have to have the, uh, you don't have to have the squiggly lines, right? It says, yes, the person is Matt. That still worked, right? But if I was to turn around and go, uh, Enough. You can see now it's already got a red line under else declarations that it's screwing with it already, right? But if I save that and I try and display it, it's got, you know, unexpected token. It's got else there. It doesn't make sense, right? But if I was to go back and put the squiggly lines in, and then everything would go back to being happy, right? Even the else state. Even, even if I have if on the one, but the else statement only has a single line in it, it's still gonna it's still gonna work, right? So you can see here, right? Another line is like so it worked correctly. So just be mindful of that when you're coding. Is that you know you don't have to have the squiggly lines. But I can tell you, it's not a good practice to get into. Um, that's gonna bite you one day. Um, anyways, so. That's it for the if the beginning of the if statement. Let's continue on. There's also this concept of not equal to. Um, let's actually comment this out. Let's look at it from the uh, not equal to. So not. So exclamation mark in programming means not. I'm 99% I'm sure it's for the same for Python, but but it's really it's not so it's not equal to so that means that not equal to as opposed to the equal equal is equal to so which is good useful it actually becomes a powerful programming tool even just the not symbol you see the use of the not symbol in many places you might even see it in front of a function call you might the, the this not operator this exclamation point that means not you know it says you know, switches something from being true to being false, right? Like if it's not equal to true, then do this, right? So, you know, the, you start to get under that, but we'll look at those things, but it, it the not symbol is, is you know, just that, because it makes sense. So if I was to turn around and save this and display it, the not is incorrect, right? Because it's equal to 100, right? So this is equal to 100, so it's actually true. So that's it's going to go to the else statement, right? Because this should actually be true, right? If it's not equal to 100, which it is, it is 100 right now. If it's not equal to 100, then this not equals is correct. But that's not what's happening here, right? Because it is equal to 100, so it's incorrect. So it's, it gives you the opposite, right? OK, so let's look at this idea equal, equal, and equal. <laughs> Um, let's comment this out. Equal, equal, and equal. So I kind of started to touch on that previously, right? Um, so there's something interesting here with the ID. Now, the equal, I kind of talked about the equal and the equal already, right? Like you can't set, like you use the equal sign to set a value to a variable, right? You use the equal sign to set, you know, a, a value to, you know, setting mat the value to the first name variable or the placeholder, right? That's what the single equal sign to. You're setting the variable, right? Um, and then the double equal sign is like doing a comparison. Right, it's doing a comparison, right? Does ID equal 100? But you can actually have three equal signs, and not only is it doing um, a comparison of the value, but also of the data type, right? Which actually kind of becomes useful, right? Um, this idea of the data types are the same. Because, you know, when you think about it, 
there's nothing keeping you from having a string value of 100, right? You may end up getting from a date some data from a database where the 100, it may be a number, but because you put it in double quotation marks, it ends up becoming a string. So it's no longer an integer, right? So, so this sort of becomes a different of these operators, you know, comparison operators. Um, so let's take a look at when I do it that way. Um, this should give me it's if it is correct. It actually translated it. That's interesting. Put a space in there. I wonder if I put a space in there. Yeah, it's incorrect, not time. OK, so you can see here that it's doing some work for us, right? Like when I ended up going that the first time, it said it's correct. And that's because often be, it'll actually, and this is sort of the part of where you get, have to get used to things a little bit by just practicing and, and using it, is that so this comparison here from the data type perspective, it because it was 100 in a single, here, why don't I look at it this way first, right? It's fine, it's, it's incorrect. What is going on? Where's 100? Oh, look at that. I got 100 in quotation marks up here. Ha! OK, let's. <laughs> Sorry about that. I My bad. OK. OK, ID is 100, right? I had it in quotation marks. So these two should be equal and in data type, right? And in data type, right? So let's let's run this. And it goes, yes, this triple equal is correct because 100 is an integer and the way it's set up here is 100 is an integer right if i was to turn around and put quotation marks around this it turns that 100 into a string right and it's not gonna well hopefully i won't be incorrect this time <laughs> ah, it says it's incorrect right because it's trying to do a comparison not only of the value but of the of the actual data type so if I was to take one of the equal signs away and take a look at it, it says it's correct because that comparison operator automatically converted that into an integer. It sort of said, are the values the same? And really 100 as a as an integer and 100 as a string, they can be considered the same, right? So that's why it's a different if it's three because then you're actually doing a comparison, which is at a new level of detail, which is the data types are the same. So as you can see here, and when I put in the third equal sign there, it gives says it's incorrect because it's also not only is it comparing the value, but it's also comparing the data type, right? Uh, how are we doing here? Questions? Okay, let's keep going. So let's look at this from the string perspective too, right? Um, and the not equal sign. So you got the same sort of thing with not equals, right? So let's just check here that it's 100, ID is 100. So doing comparison to one on one is it's gonna go, it's gonna say, this should, should be this line of code, it's correct. All right, so it's doing that comparison, right? the not equal to because the 101 is not equal to right and because it's actually because interesting it's done the comparison um on data type too and it still worked that's interesting no it's failing what happens if i go turn around and go 100 so this should this work it shouldn't work because it's considered a string at this point of time right 100 is actually a string because it's in quotation marks so when i look at it here it says oh it's not equal to right Strange, even though it says 100 here, it's correct because it's not equal. It's using the not sign, but it's a string, right? So it's doing a data type comparison also. But as soon as I take away the, uh, as soon as I take away the quotation marks here, it's going to turn around and say it's incorrect because they are equal. Right? It is incorrect because 100 is equal to 100 right and as a data type they're also equal as data type 
so when I'm saying it's not equal, that's false, right? So the if this evaluates to false, whoops. In a way, that's the way you can look at an if statement. If your comparison is evaluating, another way to look at it, if your comparison is evaluating to true or false. So that's kind of the question that you're asking yourself of what's in the if statement here. Is that equal to true or false? And that's if true, then do this. Otherwise, do this, right? So depending on what happens in here is what's going to end up, how it's going to decide on the if and or the else, right? So if I turn around and, you know, if ID equals 100, you know, the ID is 100, not equal to 100, that's false. So it's not going to do the, that, going to go somewhere else because if has to be true. This if statement needs to evaluate to true. Otherwise, do the else statement. Right. Okay, let's look at this. We could do things that even get even more complicated with stuff. Um, let's do it this way. Okay. So we have this thing called type of, right? So let's go this. Let's hear. I'm going to comment out this line of code and look at it from this way perspective first. Okay. So if if the field, whatever that is, is 10, you know, the field is field. Otherwise, the field is undefined. So let's see what this does. The field is 10, right? And that kind of makes sense, right? It's just true. It's not, right? So it, the value field exists, right? So it considers it true, right? But if I'm looking at it from a type of perspective, right? What we're really looking at here, just to be clarifying, we're looking at this type of operator. I should have probably put that in the comments. Okay, so it's this idea of a type of, this really starts to become super useful for us, right? Is that, is that we can, we can, if fields are undefined, like you'll find as you're coding stuff, that sometimes fields will come back and the type is undefined. And it's kind of like the difference between what's an integer and what's a string value and how, you know, making sure that the data types match, right? And if something's undefined, you may not want to deal with it, right? Like you say, hang on, raise an error because this is undefined and I need this value, right? So something, sometimes you, you want things not to be undefined. So as a programming language, we got in JavaScript, we got this ability to evaluate the type of a field, whether it's defined or undefined. And if it's defined, then let's look at the data. If it's undefined, I don't even look at the data, right? So when I look at this, okay, it still says the field is 10, which makes sense, right? Because it's still a data type, right? What happens if I get rid of this? It actually said not the const declaration. It's already giving us errors, right? It's already giving us errors. So this is the nice thing. Anyways, it's it's a the type of operator allows us to evaluate what kind of field it is. That's really what I all I need to say here. Um, okay. Let's continue on and look at the else if statement and having building actually a larger if else statement. And this is leads us in will lead us into the switch statement. But OK. So this idea, right? So we've got if else, if else idea. So I've got an instrument here of a ukulele. If the instrument is guitar, display the name. If it's ukulele, display it here. Else, if it's a mandolin, do this. That sort of idea, right? So it gives us the ability to evaluate one thing and have, you know, different, you know, different responses based on what the instrument is, right? 
Um, and that's what the if else statement could do for us, right? So if I, do I have that again? No, okay. So the answer is a ukulele, right? Now, if it's not known, it's going to say that the ukulele is not known to me, right? That idea, right? So it goes to this line, right? So you got this if else, if else, if, right? So you can actually ask another if statement and then fall into another else statement and then go to another else statement. Right, so that allows us to evaluate things, but then it starts. This will, you'll see this when we look at the switch statement. You begin to ask ourselves, do we really want to do it this way? Because it starts to become a little bit more coding. And if else, getting too embedded and having too many if else statements isn't a good programming practice. And we'll look at that from the switch statement perspective. Um, let's also look at logical operators a little bit more. Hang on. Okay, so. Here we have this ability to define an object, right? So here's an object. And what I can do is if the teacher, and I can ask these questions, right? We've got these different logical operators. So if it's greater than and equal to, so if the age is greater than or equal to 50, and the teacher education, so I got an and and here, sort of asking, so the if statement, if it evaluates to true, then just display this. Right, so that's kind of what happens here. Right, so Peter is old and educated. I'd like to think so, but you can see here this still is evaluating to true. Right, both of these, and right, and each one of these equals. So this is this. If he, any of these are, are false, right, it won't like the and operator puts these two together, right? So here it says, gives me nothing. Didn't give me any, didn't display anything. I'd have to put an else statement in there. All right, so it's a, if this is true and this is true, display this. If this is false, that means everything's false. Right, this is one of the, uh, this and sign will about put everything to false if and, it has to both, right? Anyways, that's how that would work. Um, let's comment this out. Yeah, we can get even more. Right, you can even have, you know, and, and you can have a whole bunch of stuff, right? Else if, and you can compare things together, right? Um, so here, if the automobile is greater than or equal to 2003, but it's less than or equal to 2023, so it's greater than 22, less than it. it's a Ford, right on, it's a new Ford. If it's less than, you know, greater than 2010 and less than 20 when it's used, that sort of idea, right? That's what you can do. And this and sign can be used more than once. So that's what I'm really trying to make the point there, right? And so I don't really need to demo this. This works in code. But there you go, Ford Bronco is new as Ford, whatever. Okay, let's look at this one. So there's also this or operator that's kind of like uh, the and, but it's not. It's an or. <laughs> um, okay. So here's one student, Jerome, whatever, age 45. If the student age is less than six or greater than 64, right? Student has free, sweet freedom, 
right? If you're under six and you're over 64, you're probably not in school yet and you're retired, right? So you got freedom. Now then if you're greater than six years old, but less than 18, you're busy studying. And if you're older than 18 and under 64, you're probably busy with adult learning, right? There you go. So you can see here, we've got the use of an or. So this is sort of, we're looking at the boundaries of the student age, and this will evaluate to true at this time at 45. No, but if they're uh, five years old, it's gonna tell us that Jerome has sweet freedom, right? But as soon as Jerome becomes, you know, seven, there you go. But what do we got here? Let's go 19 to 35. Let's go 35. Yeah, it's just a busy learning, adult learning. Anyways, this is kind of repetitive. It's busy the adult learning. Okay, so let's look at one last thing here, and then we'll go on to the switch statement. Okay, so then the tertiary uh, ternary operator. You do have this weird thing, and I don't find I use it that often, but some people are a big fan of the ternary operator. It allows you, and it's this idea of the question mark colon, right? So it's kind of like having this embedded if else statement, right? So this is really the equivalent of, actually, why don't I take this? So the ternary operator is like this. If student age is equal to 45, Okay, this ternary operator with this question mark and then the colon is pretty much this, right? So I can I can write out console log. Here, let's see what that does. Uh-oh, student is not defined. What's going on there? Oh, okay. Oh, look at that. Oh, what happened there? Oh, that's student not here. Okay, let's uncomment that. Okay. So here we got student age 45, not equal 45. Let's look at that. You can see here, not 45, not 45. Those both, you know, did the same thing, right? Evaluated, evaluated 45 and their age, whoops, is not 45, it's 35. So let's turn around and make that 45. You can see here what it does is it's still 45, right on, right? But as you can see here, this one line of code, this one line of code did the same thing as this, right? Because we got it showing up here twice, 45, 45 is happening twice. So really the ternary operator is like, that's the question mark. So this is the if do this, else do this. Right, so that's really what the ternary operator is. is very so similar to an if else statement. It becomes super, you know, if you've got want to tighten up your code and you want to do it this way. And it, again, it's the sort of thing that's really only going to work when you got this single line of code. If you really had a whole bunch of other work that you were doing um, in here and this idea, like you've got multiple lines of code. Um, going on here in the wrong key on the keyboard sorry right if you had more than one line of code here you know doing something else i don't know another console log not really got a good idea but i mean whatever you get the point is that that 
the, no longer does this idea of using a ternary operator really make sense. It's really for a very simple evaluation and to do something and respond to it. It could be super useful if it's if it, if you are. It is this simple of of a comparison if else statement. It certainly tightens up your code, um, but you're not going to use it when you start having you know more. You're doing more work on the if or the else statement, right? That's what the tertiary ternary operator is. Okay, let's look at the switch statement. This won't take us long because it's only three blocks of code. Okay, so the switch statement really allows us to be a little bit more, the code looks nicer, right? So when I look at this from the, from the when I looked at it from the instrument perspective, right? When I looked at that, right? The if else, if else, and the console log and things like that, it starts to get, there's more code. Why not have it simple, right? Switch on, switch on the instrument, right? Let's do a switch on the instrument, right? And then it just does, so you've got this switch statement. So you're asking, what is it switching on? What is the variable or the value that I'm switching on, right? And then based on what's there, I'm gonna, I've got all these different cases. If it happens to be guitar, if it happens to be ukulele, if it happens to be banjo, right? So that's really what you have the case. And then you also have to have the break. Because what the break will do is after it does the console log, the break will kick you out of the switch statement, right? And we'll see this in a moment. Let's 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 sort of take a look at what happens here when I run this. Okay. So when we look at this, huh. oh, I know what's going on. Hang on a sec. I need to switch this. Needed to switch my JavaScript. Let's look at this again. I might need to. Is it going to work? Let's see. Play what you want. OK, so back to the switch statement. Play what you want, because the harp isn't one of the case of the mandolin, the guitar, the ukulele, or the banjo. So what happened is it went to the default, right? So when I did a switch statement, it fell, it does a comparison on all those items and it didn't find it. So it does what's in the default position, right? So if I was to turn around and change this to banjo, everybody would leave the class, right? No, I like playing the banjo. Anyway, so if it's a banjo, you can see here, we're gonna hear some powerless. What was her name again? I don't remember what that musician's name was. Anyways, when she played, she was in Victoria, Nelly Furtado. When she played Powerless, there's a banjo on there, and the guy who plays the banjo is like the best banjo player of like 15 years ago. He was like, anyway, I can't remember his name now. It'll come back to me. My brain doesn't work as well. Anyways, so that's what the switch statement, right? I had banjo here. The switch statement is evaluating what the instrument is, right? Saying what instrument is it? doing comparisons and saying, oh, there it is, great. Display powerless, break out, right? So if I was to actually comment out the break, it's gonna keep falling through and actually also execute the default. So let me take a look at what happens there, right? It'll fall through. And so that's why it says play powerless, play what you want, because the break is what really pushes it out of the switch statement, right? So the break becomes super important, oops. Right, so again, if I was to turn around and, and comment out this break up here, or if I had no breaks, it's just going to keep falling through and it's going to do all of these, all the console logs. So it really does need the break to break out of the switch statement, right? So you can see here, it actually, whoops, never got down. Oh, it did the evaluation, it still got to banjo. So it only did this one, but if I was to turn this into guitar, so it's doing the comparison, it's switch on the instrument, it's gonna find guitar, it's gonna do this console log, because there's no break, I've commented out the break, it's now gonna go console log and this those ones too, right? So, and that's what it's done, right? It's telling you to do all of that work, right? So that's the importance of having that break statement. In fact, that break statement works in lots of places, but mostly you'll find it's used in in um, 
switch statements. Okay, so that's that the basics of the switch statement, right? You have all these different cases to evaluate, and then you also have a default. And essentially what happens is the switch statement, when it finds a match, it'll it'll execute the code until it finds a break and break out of the switch statement. So it'll actually go run through multiple case statements if it, there's no break. And that sort of gets highlighted in the next example. So let's take a look at that. Not in this example, I went after it and then we're done. Okay, so let's, let's see who's starting to get a practical example, right? Switch the date, right? So the get day, if I instantiate a date object in JavaScript and I go dot get the day, it's gonna return the day as a number, right? The get day returns the day as a number. And then given that it, here's the number, it'll actually, and then it's zero based array, it starts on the Sunday. So you can see, he, you can see here, to check out any questions. Is it Bella Fleck? If it was Bella Fleck, I think you might be right. Anyway, so let's so if you the the is a numeric value that get the day from the date object that you instantiate, right? And then the day becomes Sunday or whatever the case statement is, zero one. So you, here we're doing a case statement not with words like mandolin and guitar like we did previously. We're actually doing switches on on and this is can be a good way to do it right to do it based on numbers and this is what this is really demonstrating right is the ability to do a switch on numbers and then you output let's say a string of data right and that's you know today's tuesday well today is tuesday actually um that's kind of interesting but this is where it gets even more powerful in a way is to look at the switch statement and purposefully purposefully having managing the switch statement and where your breaks take place, right? So look at this, right? I've got, I'm going to switch on, here's an array. Well, I could do it different ways. Um, yeah, I can show switch. Anyway, so let's, how do I want to do this? Let's comment this, okay, let's comment these out. So let's look at this from this perspective, the switch statement, back to that switch statement based on the day, right? So I can get the day. So it's a new, that's a number, it comes back, get day of the week as a number, right? So I know that the way the weeks are structured from you know the data object of JavaScript is that if it's zero or six, it's zero Sunday and six is Saturday, right? So that means you know this is a weekend day. And if I break out, that means it skips those case statements. But I can then stack up these case statements for the weekdays, right? So it actually starts to become the switch statement actually starts to serve a, an interesting purpose in the way that you're using it logically in your programming if you have to make decisions and you have to make the some decisions have the same answer, right? So you can make that decision based on a switch statement and then have the same answer for it, right? Um, and it falls out, and there you go. It's a weekdays. Today's a weekday. Again, so if I wanted to, I could switch this. You know, this kind of also works from the concept of an array, right? Like think of think of the switch statement. Doesn't matter where the data is coming from in the switch statement. In a roundabout way, like I can, I have an array here of values, and in the position three, what's in that position? One, two, three, should give me. It's going to be a weekday, right? Anyways, that's weekday, right? If I wanted to do sweet array position zero, that's going to return a zero. That's going to give me a week, uh, a weekend day. This is weekend day. Right, so I just wanted to show you the way that the switch statement can work. It can either be something that's a numeric, it can be a, a text string value, it can be a numeric value, and even come from an array. Anyways, that's all I got. Sorry, I'm four minutes over today. Woohoo. Oh, there's a question here. Is there a question or is that left over? Valor Valentine. Oh, we got some questions. Do you guys still have questions? Yes, um, more like um, not really a question, just to see um, my understanding right. Um, so 
um, so far we've been using the JavaScript and then um, looking at the values in the console, right? So suppose um, I create a script, maybe base.js, and then I import the script in my HTML. Um, yes. I, if the script has variables defined, it means I can use those variables in my HTML script, right? With the curly brackets and the dollar sign, call those variables. In your HTML? Yeah, so in my HTML script, maybe index.html, I have in the same folder structure, I have this base.js script, which has um, object defined, right? And then I add the script line in my HTML file. Yes. Can I use those variables in the HTML? Well, you can't use it directly in the HTML. Like you couldn't, you couldn't, um... Like you couldn't have it like a uh, dollar sign squiggly bracket, you know, whatever person dot name. You can't have it directly in the HTML, mm -hmm. but you can you can use it with like this script is available to you, right? Like what's happening in the scripting, and that's really where this other tag goes right like so when i uh, where did i have that hang on whoa does it switch no i used the where was it hang on it's four templates yeah here it was here yeah here's a good example of it yeah so why don't i open should i open this one hang on a sec Oh, I know, hang on, I did demo. Let's put it in here. This is a great question, by the way. <laughs> So this is more how you're going to want to do it, right? Like in the sense that that so what's this document.body.innerhtml is that that's going to emit it to the h to the the web page or the html page. So why don't I actually comment here? Let's comment this out. So here I've got this variable in my inside my javascript Right. And yep. I got this ability to have these and the dollar these variables here. Uh oh, hang on a second. That's not gonna work. I need this. Where did I have that? I need the first name, last name. Hang on, give me a sec. Hang on, give me a sec. I was too fast. <laughs> There we go. Okay, sorry about this. Just let me clean up this code so I don't cause too much confusion. Hmm, what's going on here? A second. I really need that Blanca code. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. So what I have here, right? Here's the first name and these variables have data values in them, right? And I still, use the squirrely brackets but i've still got like the html the unordered list tag and the list item tag is there right and i'm embedding it but i'm still all embedding it in a string 
that then gets written out to my HTML. Like I have to you make reference to the document and within the body tag. So here on this index, so hang on, I'm going to run this. So what I need to do actually is comment this out. OK. So what's going to happen here? Uh, I'm interesting to see what happens here with this. So let's run this. Let's see, it's actually put that there. It's just turn around and just put that straight, just treating it as though it's just regular text in an HTML page. Why did that not emit that list demo.js? Ooh, why is that not working? Interesting. You've asked me a question that, oh, you know what? I don't know why. Because it's failing. Okay, let's try that. Okay, so you can see here that I was still, because I have to emit this HTML, I can't just do, I can't just use the variable there. I, do, mm -hmm. I just can't, right? You can't, you can't mix JavaScript with the HTML. Unless, of course, you put it within that script tag. So the source of this script is actually going to run, right? And okay. so, all right, I think I see, I see it. In a roundabout way, I think what you should do is probably spend a little bit of time of mixing the JavaScript with, with uh, HTML. Like it's, it's not, it, you can't just turn around and mix the two together. Uh, without a little bit of thought, and and so um, having these variables come out here, even in the demo.js script, right? When I've got the demo.js script, let's say first name, let's put that in there. Um, where are we here? Like you can't, let's actually put it afterwards too. There you go. So you can't make reference to, like it's still there. They're two separate, they're really, they execute. What's inside this script executes within the JavaScript engine of the browser. Like when you actually think of a, a internet browser, there's actually a piece of software that runs inside the browser that's actually parsing and interpreting and looking at JavaScript and going, okay, what do I do with this JavaScript? And at this particular example, what it's doing is it's taking what this HTML that was created here and emitting it into the body of that HTML page into the body of it. So what I'm doing is I'm injecting this HTML into the web page, right? I've injected it into the web page, right? Where you can see here that I no longer have that that first name variable isn't available to me because it's got to be within the actual script. But you, we'll, we can touch a little bit more upon this in time. I'm not going to do it today, but you're asking a very good question. That's kind of why I wanted to follow up with it is that oh. JavaScript is something that runs separately and you have to sort of interact with HTML uh, through the, what's known as the document object model or the DOM. And you'll get much more into that with Noman in next semester, but you do have this document object model. What I'm really wanting to just show you is just more the JavaScript syntax. But we, I can touch upon that in the in one of the coming lectures for sure, because we kind of need that uh, to understand that a little bit more. You're actually thinking into the future, sorry. <laughs> That's a good thing to do. Yeah. But
Thanks, Thanks Valentine. <laughs> Thank you too. Ethan, do you have a question or are those from before? Uh, this is just in regards to submitting the QAP. Um, is it just a matter of like making a zip file with like our JavaScript and HTML and stuff in it, and we just send it to you? What does what does what? Uh, sorry, I can't remember. What is Maurice asking for? Like when we were doing like uh, web development, Maurice, he wanted us to submit it via a zip file. So basically, like put everything in one spot and just send it to him. Yeah, yeah. Do it, do it the same way. Like Maurice is actually more the lead on this. So send it to Maurice first, and then what he does is he marks what he the sections that he created, and then he fires them over to me, and I gotta mark my sections. Oh, okay. So yeah, follow the follow the pattern that Maurice has done for you in the past. Okay, so yeah, we'll just submit uh, via the assignment portal, right? Yeah. The zip yeah. file with all our web stuff and JavaScript and whatever. Yeah. And you'll be able to correct it. Yeah. Okay, per then. Perfect. All right. So thanks, everyone. Let's take a break. And I'll come back at 1130. And I'll just hang out for half an hour. I got no lecture. Don't feel as though you have it's optional support session. But if you have questions, uh, more than happy to help. So I'll just go, let's take a 15 minute break and then come back and uh, I'm here to ask, answer any questions you may have. Thanks you guys.